so let's continue with our software engineering lecture and specifically now with a closer look at agile methods. We already briefly mentioned them in the last uh, lecture, but one of the main reasons why agile projects um, or the agile method methodology was, was started at all was that there was a quite uh, quite significant problem with uh, IT projects and especially with uh, larger IT projects. So there's a survey from 2012 here and on average, as you can see, uh, large IT projects with a budget of over $15 million, 45% um, of these projects were over budget. 7% were over time, and 56% um, of these projects uh, provided less value than they predicted. I think there was a, a recent case where, where uh, Accenture was sued by another company because they paid something like $10 million for a new web page, but um, basically nothing really worked and so on. So this was, a, was definitely a project that didn't uh, deliver as much value as, as was predicted. And in that survey, 17% uh, of these projects failed so massively that they actually threatened the survival of the company. So there's obviously, obviously a, pro a problem with planning IT projects, especially large IT projects. And uh, part of the reason for that is uh, what we already talked about um, in the last part, that the plan-driven methods for software engineering were something that was um, developed in the 1960s when the field of software engineering started to develop at all. And of course, it was based on other engineering disciplines like construction engineering or mechanical engineering. And these fields usually uh, don't have um, so quickly changing requirements, but this is a big problem in, in software. So the, the business cycles for software are, um, are getting more and more rapid. So that means the requirements change ever more quickly. And that means that if you um, base your project on a plan driven method, then you always need to, uh, to rework your, your plan basically to um, deal with the changing requirements. And, um, that means that when you have, especially when you have uh, smaller projects, then you can run into, uh, it can get to the point where you actually spend more effort on the management and the, um, the management on the, of the plan than on the actual development. And that's of course not going to, to help you develop a, a project, a product quickly, uh, especially a product that actually does what it's supposed to do. Um, and so to deal with these, really quickly changing requirements. Um, the, the Agile Manifesto was uh, introduced in the 1990s and this started a general shift towards using these so-called Agile methods. And uh, the starting point for all of these was the so-called Agile Manifesto and you can also read it online but there's um, more or less there's just four basic um, basic rules or basic suggestions, which means that uh, the th things on the left are considered more valuable than the things on the right. It doesn't mean that you should completely ignore uh, the things on the right, but um, that in general it's better to focus on the things on the left. So. Um, don't focus too much on uh, having having fixed processes and using all sorts of tools. Rather, just basically talk to people. This is meant by the first part. Individuals and interactions are more valuable than processes and tools. So you don't need a form for for every little thing. Uh, if you just just discuss this with other people, usually um, it will work better. Then. Working software over comprehensive documentation. This is a, a contentious one. So um, usually it's also important to still have documentation, but uh, if you spend all your time on the documentation and don't actually produce a working software, then of course it doesn't, uh, doesn't help quite as much. Then customer collaboration is also an important part of many agile methods. So the customer should actually 
um, not just negotiate a contract at the start of the project and then sit back and wait until it's finished, but the customer should always be involved in so they should also be interested in being involved. They um, should commit to, to giving, giving input regularly and helping steer the project while it's going. Um, and last but not least, probably the most important part is this one. Responding to change is uh, easier and better than following a plan. Because then you either have to, to follow the plan even if the, the um, the requirements and the, the environment conditions have changed uh, or you have to, to adjust the plan all the time. So it's uh, better to not make a big master plan up front, but rather put, just plan tiny steps and uh, respond to change when it happens. So these four things are basically the foundation for all of the agile methods we're going to, to look at later. Um, so agile methods are quite popular so here's um, results from a survey and this is kind of uh, hard to read so on this scale um, you get uh, estimates of the success quota so how many percent of projects uh, were successful and so in fact most of the projects actually uh, or most of the people that were surveyed for uh, for this uh, graph estimated their projects were somewhere within the area of um, uh, 70 to 100 percent successful actually and um, the important information is now that the uh, the highest uh, success quota, something between 90 and 100 percent, or uh, 80 and 90 percent at least, uh, were achieved with agile methods. And hybrid and uh, selective approaches, selective means you either select a plan driven or an agile method, and hybrid means you select something that's in between the two, um, two things they actually achieved on uh, on general, a slightly lower success quota um, across all sorts of projects. So there's a lot of uh, information in that um, in that graph, but the, the general agreement is that um, if you use agile methods, then your projects will probably have a higher success rate than if you either use plan-driven and uh, agile, uh, depending on the scenario, or if you use hybrid methods. This is maybe a little simplistic, as I've already said. It's definitely not the case that one, one size fits all. So always using agile will also not work. If you then encounter a project where it's just not the right tool for the job, then you will still get a low success quota, probably. But um, so. Uh, at least among the people who, who answered the survey, um, among the project managers, there's a, a very high appreciation of the um, Agile uh, methods. All right, so what are the most important aspects of Agile models? We briefly talked about this last time already. We always have uh, interleaved activities, so especially the specification, the design, and the development. Um, happen in cycles or even at the same time. Um, we follow an incremental development approach, so we always have regular releases, um, maybe every two weeks, that the customer then gives feedback on. And we also try to use prototyping tools, so um, we build a mock-up of the user interface, for example, in HTML5, uh, with something that's really quickly quickly put together to just show an idea of how the user interface might look like. We might even use something like paper prototyping where we really just sketch out how the user interface might look like on a piece of paper. So these three put together are some of the most central aspects that all agile methods share. And probably the most important one is the actual interleaving of activities. We already had a look at this uh, this diagram last time. I'd like to, to go back to that in a, uh, right now and talk again about how this illustrates the, the interleaving of activities. So 
Here, for example, we have the, the actual development and the deployment um, happening at the same time uh, as the, the communication phase, uh, the discussion phase and the planning for the second iteration. And uh, basically immediately after the, the deployment has finished, we already start with the modeling and the construction for the next part. And so some of the phases actually do happen in parallel. Um, they repeat again and again. Um, we always have a, a small increment that we can deliver to the, the customer and especially also get feedback on. This is a very Im important part. And um, that feedback will then influence uh, how the, the next iteration is developed. And of course, if we uh, only spend maybe one or two weeks on each increment, then we can um, uh, we, we can be very flexible and quickly react to, to changes in our uh, requirements in our environment uh, and so on. Um, and also, of course, to quickly get out and push out an increment uh, is, is something that we want to get feedback on. It might be worth using um, a mock-up uh, or some kind of, of uh, front-end that's probably not going to be in the final uh, product to just uh, get quick feedback on a specific feature even if we've just implemented it in a way that won't uh, hold up to to um, to actual usage. So uh, prototyping is also an important part here. If we want to, to get early feedback on some kind of uh, feature that would otherwise take too long to develop, for example. All right. In a bit more detail, what principles do all agile methods share? I already mentioned this, we need involve, to involve the customer. So um, at least every two weeks after one increment has been delivered, we need to uh, collect feedback from the customer and see if this is going into the right direction. This will also help us to, to plan the next increment. So um, in general, the, the priorities of the customer should, um, should influence in what order we we, um, we develop features and deliver them to the um, to the customer then um, we shouldn't enforce too much too much uh, processes and too much uh, rigid rigid rules on the development team so um, a key aspect of agile methods is also that the development team is basically free to organize themselves at least during one uh, two week iteration and so there's no micromanagement basically happening this is really important then um, embrace change is also important don't don't think that you can kind of uh, squeeze through the project without adapting uh, requirements. So the requirements you define in the first iteration will not be the same the same ones that you end up with in the in the final iteration. So they will change, um, and for that reason, it's also important to try and design that into the code. Um, don't try to uh, design the code upfront in a way that it will be able to, to deal with uh, changing requirements, but rather build the code for the requirements um, you have at the time. And when the requirements change, then you just have to refactor the code uh, or uh, rewrite it, adapt it to the, to the new requirements. Um, this isn't, of course, without issues. So, um, the customer should always be involved. That also means that the customer uh, needs to, to want uh, to be involved. Um, and that in turn requires that the, the customer has at least a bit of background knowledge that they don't just expect a, a finished product uh, without having to think about the, the internals and so on. So the customer, or at least one of the employees of the customer, if it's a larger company, um, 
should commit to to like actually being part of the development team for the duration of the project and to to continuously give feedback um there's many stakeholders of course many people who who have some kind of of interest in the direction the project is taking it's not like in a, in a plan driven method where you have a manager who decides what's going to be done and then the rest has to do that uh, there's a lot more flexibility of course but that also means that there's um, uh, a potential for conflict uh, because people just have different priorities and this is something that needs to be resolved uh, at least in, in every planning cycle um, in the beginning then um, Sometimes there's, of course, a problem with personalities in a, that can happen in every team. But uh, if you leave the team to organize themselves, as one of the key principles of Agile actually suggests, then it can be more difficult to deal with um, personality conflicts, basically, or just personal issues between people. Um, for, for this kind of scenario, can actually it, it might sometimes be more helpful to have a, a, a manager who just tells people what to do and to get on with it. If uh, there's this self-management happening, then that might also uh, cause issues if people just don't get along with each other. Um, and especially if you want to employ agile methods in large companies, then they have a very strong tendency towards using uh, fixed, uh, rigid processes for everything and having internal contracts and so on. So um, agile methods often aren't a really good fit for the culture of large companies. This might also cause some, some issues. Um, uh, if you want to introduce these kinds of processes in a larger company, then you might have to deal with a lot of, of um, bureaucratic resistance, basically. Um, other issues with Agile methods, um, if, if you do constant refactoring, that means uh, it's extra work that doesn't provide additional features. And if your project starts to get time pressure for whatever reason, in theory, Agile methods aren't supposed to have time pressure, but in reality, of course, it happens all the time. And if that happens, then people start to um, take shortcuts and neglect the refactoring. And that in turn means that the, the code quality will probably go down because um, if the code wasn't designed to be flexible from the start, this is something Agile doesn't su suggest, then if you leave out the refactoring, then it will quickly become a mess. So that is sometimes a bit of a problem. And if you have companies that have m more than one Agile project running at the time, then what often happens is that after two weeks, um, people switch to a different project actually, this is sometimes even encouraged to um, avoid people getting too attached to one single uh, part of a project. But that also means that the environment is a lot less stable. And um, for example, to deal with this, you would still need to um, provide a bit of documentation. And for the same reason, it's also um, more difficult to to maintain and and evolve the software later on because the the original team probably doesn't exist anymore it's been split up across uh, five other projects and because documentation isn't as highly valued in, in agile methods then it might also be more difficult to to actually figure out how a specific bit of the software is working later on because um, there's basically nobody uh, left anymore th that you can actually ask so um, as a rule of thumb uh, here's a table of when um, rather to use agile and when to use plan driven method so if you have, for example, if you have a really large uh, and distributed development team, then it might actually be more sensible to use a plan-driven method. Same if you have a large and distributed or distributed system that needs to be designed. Um, if you need a formal analysis um, and have a long system lifetime, uh, if you're in a large corporation, then these are all 
uh, factors that are more in favor of a plan-driven method. On the other hand, if you have a small uh, and co-located development team, if it's a small system, um, which also maybe doesn't have quite a, as a long lifetime and will be iterated often, if you're in a startup or something like that, then all of these are factors that are in favor of using an agile method. So um, once again, one size doesn't fit all. And even if a lot of, of uh, management people from the previous survey obviously think that agile is the way to go, that doesn't mean um, that there aren't also scenarios where plan-driven methods uh, are actually better suited to, to solving the issue at hand.